so till we actually kick things off. Thank you all very much for your time. Good afternoon. Welcome to this uh, webinar on what young Americans think about nuclear weapons. So I'm Sharon Weiner with the Carnegie Corporation of New York, and I have with me here today experts on polling, experts on social media, experts on nuclear weapons, and a few things in between. So thanks for joining us. Today we're going to be discussing the results of a poll that was conducted jointly between the Carnegie Corporation of New York and the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. And then we'll be having a conversation about not just these results, but about communicating with Americans about nuclear weapons. So let me just briefly introduce uh, our panel today. And if you'd like more information about each of them, you can find that on the website uh, from which you join this, this discussion. So first off will be Dina Schmeltz, who's with the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. So Dina is an expert in polling and she will lead us off talking about the results more broadly of the poll, but also honing in on some of the more interesting things we discovered, especially about communicating with the younger generation. Also joining us is Gabriela Hernandez of the Arms Control Association, Ananya Malhotra of the Quincy Institute, Emma Smith with Rethink Media, and Avery Restrepo with the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists. And I'll provide a little bit more information about each of them. Like I said, you can find their full bios on the website. At the conclusion of our, of our conversation, you'll have an opportunity to ask questions and we can have a little Q&A back and forth. And if you'd like to submit questions, you can do that through this website, ccga.live. So that's ccga.live. And before I turn it over to Dina, let me just remind everyone that we're all here in our personal capacities. So anything we say represents our own personal opinions, but shouldn't necessarily be considered to represent those of the institutions that we're affiliated with. So with that in mind, let's get started and turn it over to Dina. What did we learn from this poll? Thank you, Sharon. Um, well, some really interesting things, actually. Uh, as Sharon said, the focus of today's discussion is on the next generation and their attitudes towards nuclear weapons. Um, but when th reflecting on the results, of course, I naturally think about my own experiences. And uh, people my age grew up at a time when nuclear issues were really part of the general zeitgeist. It wasn't just stories um, on the front pages of the newspapers, but, but nuclear weapons and nuclear issues were part of popular culture. We saw films that uh, had stars such as Paul Newman, and uh, Matthew Broderick, even Sidney Poitier, Gene Hackman, many others, and musicians as far ranging as Prince, David Bowie, Bob Dylan, and even the heavy metal band Iron Maiden sang songs about the potential nuclear apocalypse. Uh, but given the changes in the world since the end of the Cold War, it's been conventional wisdom that younger people are not as 
uh, involved or not as exposed to nuclear issues and certainly less preoccupied than people were at my age. In fact, I just read an interview with Christopher Nolan, who is the writer-director of the film Oppenheimer, and he said that when he told his teenage son that he was writing a screenplay about the crew that invented the atomic bomb, his teenage son said to him, that's just not something anybody worries about anymore. So Sharon uh, and her crew at the Carnegie Council and my survey team here at the Chicago Council wanted to test this idea and empirically measure whether that really was the case by looking at the attitudes of all Americans to see how familiar and interested they are about nuclear weapons and U.S. nuclear policy and to see whether they differed by age. So without further ado, let's look at the findings. The survey was conducted, uh, just some brief background on how we actually came up with these numbers. It was conducted by NORC, which is affiliated with the University of Chicago, using a panel survey between February 8th and 28th. Uh, it was conducted in both English and in Spanish, and uh, among over a thousand people, all adults. The margin of sampling error is plus or minus about 4%, and it's higher when you look at different generational groupings and other small groups. And people could choose whether they wanted to take the survey online or whether they wanted to take it by phone. So uh, if you, first question we, we show here is about the familiarity with various nuclear issues. And I wanted you to focus on the two left-hand bars, the dark, the dark blue and the lighter blue bars. That is together a great deal and a fair amount of familiarity. So you see that Americans are most familiar with the costs of, I'm sorry, the effects of nuclear weapons at 53% when you add those two blue bars together, and they're least familiar with the costs of nuclear weapons, 20%. In between, no more than a third say that they are familiar with the U.S. missile defense system, who the U.S. targets with nuclear weapons or U.S. nuclear weapons policy. And looking across generations, my big takeaway here is some of the bars look longer than the others, but actually there's a strong lack of familiarity across most of these issues except for the effects of nuclear weapons. And it looks like the green bar is a bit longer, uh, the Generation Z, than even older generations. But the only place where that's really significant is on the effects of nuclear weapons. There's about a 10% difference with the views of boomers um, and Generation Z on how familiar they are, but that's not given, like I said, the margin of error is greater among smaller subgroups. I would kind of call this all a wash and say they're all about the same level of familiarity and lack of familiarity. It's kind of interesting because in another survey we did last year, uh, looking at younger Americans, they tended to follow foreign policy issues less closely than older Americans, but on nuclear issues, they're not really that different than other Americans. Okay, so they're not very familiar across the board on most issues concerning nuclear weapons. Um, also, they're not really able to assess uh, benefit or harm of nuclear weapons to them personally. 58% of Americans say they're unable to judge what the benefit or harm is. 41% say they are able to. And again, generations are not that different. Um, Generation Z is a little bit more likely to say they don't know enough to judge. But, um, but in general, majorities across the board say they don't have enough information on this. So this is um, a key missing piece of awareness for Americans on nuclear issues. Um, and the prevailing view among the U.S. public is that nuclear weapons make the United States safer, but that is only the prevailing view of 47% of the public, not even, a, a, not even half. Um, combined, about 4 in 10 Americans either believe that U.S. nuclear weapons do not make a difference to national safety or they don't know enough to judge whether they do or not. And an additional 9% say they make the country less safe. 
And then looking at this by generations, there's some larger differences here than on some of the other questions. 54% of boomers and 51% of Generation X say that nuclear weapons make the United States safer compared to just 38% of millennials and 37% of Generation Z. Um, younger Americans are on the other hand, more likely to, than their senior counterparts to say that it doesn't make a difference or that it makes the country less safe. So that's one of the key differences that we find by generation. Um, the other is on deterrence. So the results I shared about the overall American public hint at a sense of hesitance among a significant portion of the public to give a solid response to some of these questions. They just don't have enough information to give uh, to, to say, to, to choose an answer. Here, the public seems to be more convinced about the deterrent effect of nuclear weapons, with a clear majority believing nuclear weapons have been very or somewhat effective at preventing conflict between the United States and other countries. 63% together say they um, think they're somewhat or very effective. But still on here, 20% say they don't know enough to say. And by generation, younger Americans here are less inclined to say that nuclear weapons have been very effective at preventing conflict. If you look at the dark blue bars, that's kind of where I would see the most differentiation here. And this could be related to younger people's preferences for foreign policy in general. We, again, we did a survey in 2022 and we looked closely at younger Americans and they were much more likely to think that military approaches to United States foreign policy were overused. And unlike their elders, they were more likely to see the defense budget decrease than increase. So that's a big difference in their views of a post-Cold War foreign policy in general, not just on nuclear policy. So taken together, these results seem to show that Americans have some conflicting views about nuclear weapons. On the one hand, they think the new nuclear arsenal is effective at preventing conflict and that might make the United States safer. But on the other hand, a majority are unable to judge the benefit or harm of nuclear weapons to them personally, and they're unsure whether it makes the country safer. And I'm just going to end with what was by far, to me, the most interesting finding and kind of um, encouraging finding is that a majority of Americans overall want to learn more. They are interested in learning more about U.S. nuclear weapons policy. And when we asked it an open-ended question, what kinds of things they would like to learn about, they said they want to know more about how nuclear weapons operate, the effects of nuclear weapons when they are deployed, and more details about U.S. nuclear policy in general. And when you look across the board, that um, curiosity about learning more about nuclear weapons uh, is really prevalent across all the age groups pretty much. Um, and especially high among Gen Z. So these results were all con collected before the recent Oppenheimer film was released. And given the surrounding buzz around the film, this might be a really unique opportunity to re-engage everyday Americans, regardless of their age, on the topic. And with that, I'm going to pass it back to Sharon and look forward to the discussion. Great. Thank you so much, Dina. Um, so for those of you who were listening to that and think, oh, give me more polling data. Uh, so I would refer you to the event web page where you can access the full report, which has all the, the details and the results. And for those of you who are thinking, oh, I have a burning question already, please remember at any time you can submit questions through ccga.live. So let's start this conversation with Gabriela Hernandez. So Gabrielle is a research associate at the Arms Control Association, but she's also an expert in uh, Russian military issues, threat perception. I'm also gonna throw in defense budgets. We once had a great conversation about defense budgets. <laughs> um, so Gabriella, thanks uh, for joining us. I know with the Arms Control Association, you have a lot of experience engaging elite crowds in DC on nuclear weapons issues. So the poll shows that Six in 10 Americans do not think that they know about enough about nuclear weapons to assess the benefit or harm to them personally. But you also have extensive experience, not just in DC, but talking about nuclear issues in Europe. So what would you say are the main differences or similarities between engaging people in DC versus folks in Europe on nuclear issues? Well, uh, first of all, um, I'd like to say kind of that the new, the conversations about nuclear weapons at the very moment in Europe are 
are very different considering the fact that for the last year and a half, Russia has engaged in a full-scale invasion of Ukraine. So Europeans are naturally at the moment much more concerned about the hot conventional war, kind of considering approximate to them. And the more noticeable consequences of the war, considering, you know, the influx of refugees. However, first of all, as many of you know, the U.S. and Russia have the largest nuclear arsenals in the world. And I do think that when we talk about Europe, we tend to generalize in terms of Americans. I think depending on the country that you're talking about in Europe, the conversation would go very differently. I would say overall, Europeans have coalesced around what they consider the Russian threat and Russia's nuclear bluffs. But in a lot of ways, everyone still has a very different definition of what being secure means. For instance, in what you would call NATO's eastern flank, then the conversation is very much about the value of nuclear deterrence and how do you achieve conventional deterrence by denial. So, and to them a lot, this war is really a sad kind of vindication of their long-held views that they believe that if Russia's left unchecked, then direct conflict between Russia and NATO is inevitable. And in their territory, Russia will kind of test Brussels' response. And But however, other allies particularly are more fearful of the possibility of nuclear war with Russia in the case of escalation or over Ukraine rather than a direct NATO-Russia conflict. Meanwhile, conversations in Washington focus far more on how the United States is facing two major nuclear powers whose vital security interests are in competition with the United States with the United States. Of course, this is China and Russia. So are you telling me that the Europeans aren't fixated on the Chinese nuclear threat? Yes, they're fixated on the hot conventional war right next to them. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you for that comparison of European and American um, notions about nuclear weapons in, in the current context. So let's shift a little bit now to generational differences, and in particular, how people access information about nuclear weapons. So we're really fortunate today to have Avery Restrepo with us. And Avery is with the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists, where they're in charge of, so, where they work on social media and engaging people through social media. And this is something I'm fascinated about because social media is a scary thing to me. Um, so the poll tells us, Avery, that millennials and Gen Z turn to social media platforms for news, whereas I'm at the tail end of the boomer world. We go to TV apparently. Um, so what should I do or, or what should we do as a community to engage people through social media on nuclear issues? Yeah, I mean, thank you, Sharon, first off, for the excellent question. And I'm very excited to be here to discuss this issue. I mean, these are things that um, I certainly think about every day and I think are really engaging. So the thing that I would like to introduce into the conversation is regardless of if you're posting as an individual or on behalf of an organization about nuclear issues, is the importance of contextualizing the issues within people's lives and drawing specific connections between like people's realities and nuclear weapons. I think, in my experience, that's one of the biggest challenges of this, because often nuclear weapons, at least in America, right, can feel really far away or, conversely, very scary and way too close. And so I think those two kind of challenges and balancing that is something that um, can definitely be overcome, but do deserve a lot of thought. So a big pattern that I found like in the work that I've done is that especially articles being shared, um, they do really well on social media if they draw connections to things in people's lives. So that could be a specific location, uh, uh, even if it could be like a show or say a movie like with Oppenheimer that people know about, or just an is another issue that is related, for instance, like housing, say, you know, a nuclear plant is going in somewhere. What does that mean for housing? Things like that. Things that people are thinking about every day. And so um, this is something that I've seen, uh, for instance, with the bulletin, with our articles, is that, you know, if you have an article going out about a nuclear plant that is using plutonium and what does that mean for proliferation? That's one thing. And for people like in the field, that's very interesting. But if you include that, oh, it's being put in Canada, 
then suddenly every Canadian who sees that at least has to kind of think, wait, is that going to be near me? Does that affect my life? Does that affect my family? Where is it in Canada? And that kind of sparks a lot more questions and engagement. And I've seen that kind of pattern. So I think thinking about that connection of what people are thinking about every day and already care about and connecting that is something that's like really powerful. And kind of following that up with, I guess, the importance of knowing your objective with social media, right? When you make a post, it could be about, you know, you want maybe we want people to join an organization. Maybe you just want people to know a really interesting fact or factoid or a current conflict, something more about a current conflict that's happening. And what do you want people to come away with, like from your post? And kind of tailoring your language to the audience that you're hoping to reach. You know, you can get as technical as you want if it's going to be about a specific paper or a specific um, like policy discussion. But reaching out to the wider audience, you kind of have to use like different language to to reach a you know to reach greater audience, um, and the importance of like tone also in that conversation. So uh, something I think a lot about too is when you look on say like YouTube or like really these platforms with like billions and billions of people, right? And if you look up nuclear weapons or you look up like nuclear policies. Often the things that will have the greatest engagement and the greatest views are things that can be like a little scaremongery, a little that are a little scary or a little shocking. And that can on paper look really like, wow, they're reaching a lot of people. But then when you think about what people are taking away from that and what, um, you know, is that really getting people to want to advocate for these issues more or to look in, uh, look into them more? Or is it um, disincentivizing people from becoming more engaged, even if it is factual? Um, I think like the way that you package some of the information is really crucial as well. You know, part of my job is looking into what people are commenting on these kinds of things. And um, people are, you know, as Gabrielle was saying, especially like in Europe, especially in areas um, really close to conflict, it is really like real. And I think getting people like information that um, can help them like understand and contextualize what's going on and kind of empower them with information that's valuable is one of the best ways to bolster a good relationship with the people that are following you or following your organization, right? I mean, something that really stood out for me in that survey, right, was that I think only 16% of people surveyed trusted social media as like a source of information. And that was something I had to think a lot about too, right? I mean, I think the importance of bolstering stronger relationships with our audiences on social media, which is, you know, for better or for worse, pretty much one of the largest audiences that we have and one of our most successful audiences that we have is, I think, like really crucial moving forward. Um, and we've been able to use things like, for instance, the Oppenheimer movie to get uh, more attention and kind of bolstering that relationship we have with the, these audiences moving forward is something that I think is very important. So. Those are some things that I think about in doing my work day to day that I hope will be helpful. So let me just follow up just really quickly. So the yeah. bulletin where you work has had these, these great articles and pages about Oppenheimer, everything from historical, you know, bringing up historical things that have been in the past and to also contemporary debates. And I guess, I think I'm right that Oppenheimer was one of the founders of the bulletin or at least a first member of chairman of the board or something. Yes, yeah. he was the first chairman of the board of sponsors. So, and it may be too soon, but are you seeing differences in conversations now that the movies come out? Yeah, I mean, I think certainly it's far more engagement, engagement certainly, and far more questions, I think, about what's happening and far more conversation, both about, say, you know, Oppenheimer and the creation of the first bomb, as well as, like, the effects of it and who was affected and, and um a lot more conversation about, you know, like World War II and the like bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, for instance, on social media. I think it's spurring up a lot of really important conversations, definitely. Um, I mean, I think the stats are still rolling out. The We've noticed like with movies, especially, they, they stay relevant for longer, say, than just like a single, you know, post or anything. And Oppenheimer will certainly have a lot of like cultural relevance, like especially within the next few weeks, especially within the coming year. Um I say definitely. Um, and I think like how we as a community can kind of use this like moving forward. Um, and I'm sure later we can have a conversation about the movie itself and what audiences may be taking away from it. Um, I think that's very nuanced and can either help or hurt um, our efforts in communi communicating on certain issues. But definitely, I would, I would agree.
Great. Thing. So I'm going to not follow that thread and ask you to compare and contrast Barbie and Oppenheimer, but just maybe that's a conversation uh, later on we could have. That'd be a great, a great further conversation, certainly. Uh, so let me move on to Emma. And Emma Smith, I'm going to ask you the same question. So you're at Rethink Media. Um, you're a specialist there in, in movement building with organizations. So using social media like Avery does to get people's attention, but you're going further than that. And you're actually trying to translate that into advocacy. So how do we engage people? I mean, the poll tells us that only about two in 10 Americans say they want to try and be part of changing nuclear policy. So I think you've got a lot of work cut out for you there, but what, how do we create that advocacy? Great. Uh, well, thanks so much for that, Sharon, and, and thank you as well to the Chicago Council and to Carnegie um, for bringing us all here to speak on, I think, what's a really important topic, particularly today. Um, to your question, I think there's a lot that goes into this question of what we can do to make engaging in nuclear weapons spaces more compelling. So I'm going to break it down into three different components, all of which I think we could speak much more in depth to, but a few top lines. Um, the first is what this data tells us about our movable middle, not only that they exist, but also where they get their information and other important information of how to identify and reach them. Um, and then second, the structure of what a persuasive message looks like. Like to actually get people to engage and, you know, for really our best shot at reaching this audience. Uh, and then finally end a bit with a few pitfalls and challenges that the nuclear community faces in particular when we're speaking about these issues with the top line out front being that spokespeople need to do a better job of highlighting policy solutions rather than just giving us overwhelming amounts of information. Um, but to start on that first point, so this data that we had a great introduction to at the beginning from Dina tells us a lot about our movable middle. So these are people that aren't already deeply invested in the nuclear space, but who could be if we identify them and reach them where they're at. So here that middle is that six in 10 that are interested in learning more. And even more so, it's that two in 10 that are already interested in engaging. And so while that two in 10 does seem like a small number, as you brought up, Sharon, when we put that in the frame of public opinion, right? But it's actually really sizable when it comes down to thinking through actual action and engagement on a topic, right? Taking, you know, 20% of the American adult population, that's about 52 million adults. And the practical reality is that social change has historically been driven by very small, active, and deeply invested groups of people. So I'm honestly very optimistic about that two in 10, but it's really about identifying and reaching them and trying to build even more. And so the most important questions then become getting a little more specific, asking what are their demographics specifically? Where do they get their news? What do they want to learn more about specifically? Because engaging on nuclear weapons issues is going to look a lot different for an 18-year-old versus an 80-year-old. And while we want both of those groups of people to be able to engage in this policy, we're going to reach them through really different mediums, really different messages, and with different aims for what that involvement actually looks like. So that gets us to the second point that I mentioned, which is what can we be doing more of to nudge that quote unquote movable middle into action? So Rethink has done lots of audience research over the years, and, and this poll, poll confirms and adds to a lot of our findings, um, which the fact of the matter is that it really all comes down to the message, which Avery perfectly set up for me. <laughs> so thanks, Avery. Um, and it's really at the basic level that a persuasive message has three parts. It has values, the problem, and then the solution. So the values piece, as Avery mentioned, is what draws people in and it helps them understand how the issue applies to them and to their life. Then the problem identifies that there's something that we should be concerned about. And then the solution tells them that there's actually something that can be done, right? This isn't hopeless. And so this is where we want to get really specific to move from informing people to actually engaging them. So for instance, for an example of this, our research has shown that Democrats are much more receptive around nuclear weapons when we message around intersectionality of issues that they already care about. So things like climate change and racial justice. And this poll shows that Gen Z tends to get their information from social media, and that's where they'd go if they are looking for more information on nuclear weapons. So if I was trying to get Gen Z Democrats specifically to engage more with nuclear issues, I'd invest with messaging on social media that shows them how nuclear weapons have impacted marginalized communities, and then I'd give them a solution to think through how they could start to engage on the issue. 
Now that sounds simple, maybe deceivingly simple. So I wanna highlight a couple obstacles that we see come up a lot in our work in doing that. Um, and the first is that we conducted research in 2019 that learned that the issue of fate control really significantly decreases people's involvement. And so this is what Avery was talking about as well, this idea of fear mongering and the problems of fear, is that people feel like they have no control over nuclear weapons policy. They aren't able to keep themselves and their families safe. And so that makes them feel powerless and like they don't want to engage in the issue at all. And so that's taught us that we really need to message in a way that's empowering, right? That directly acknowledges the fear that people has, doesn't paper over it, but it goes further into ways that they can influence that will make a real difference. Now, the second obstacle is around how we present that solution aspect. It needs to be something that's simple and something that's prescriptive. The spokespeople that I work with and train often operate under this kind of unspoken assumption that the problem that they're dealing with is a lack of information. So if they just explain the problem well enough, then their audience is going to take action based on that. Um, but unfortunately, where that often takes people is into feelings of confusion or hopelessness or just being completely overwhelmed by information, feeling still like they need to be an expert. Now, that's not to say that we shouldn't give people more information, um, but the how is just as important in that. And so when we've been able to train spokespeople to give more than background and technical context, that's when they've actually had an impact on the conversation. That's when they've been able to change from being an expert to guiding policy. So the top line here, just to sum this all up and follow my own advice, um, is that we should be identifying our movable middle, who they are, where they get their news, what they're interested in, and invest in optimistic messaging that directly shows how they can be involved and how it relates to the issues that they already care about. So I was smiling because when I when I first said this two and ten, you know, big crocodile tears. But you're telling me this is the this is actually more perhaps than expected, and that there is. I like this notion of movable middle, but I appreciate, I mean, what you've laid out between you and Avery is communicating with people on terms that are personal to them, but in ways they understand that give them a path, a path forward to do something if they want to. Right. Absolutely. And so I see Ananya sh shaking her head. So I'm going to ask her to weigh on this, in, on this conversation because uh, Ananya Maholtra, so Ananya is with the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft, but she spent um, a lot of time looking at narratives for engaging people and the role of narratives and encouraging people to think about nuclear risks, both now and you know potentially in the future. So Ananya, what should we be doing here? Help. Thanks, Sharon, and thank you to the Carnegie Council uh, for Global Affairs and Carnegie Corporation of New York for hosting this really important discussion. So it's a pleasure to be here. And I couldn't agree more in, uh, with Avery and Emma's comments about showing the everyday impact of nuclear weapons policy and meeting people where they are, giving people a sense of agency. And maybe I can give a little bit of color to examples of what some of those narratives might look like. Targets of nuclear weapons in a war that has happened in the past nuclear war potentially in the future, but also the communities that are adjacent to the production, maintenance, deployment, and security of nuclear weapons, and who face some of the consequences that have already been brought up in this conversation, including heightened risk of cancers, miscarriages, food contamination, illnesses, and deaths. Um, and so these, you know, are stories that are very neglected. And I would say that the, the current status quo pretty much relies on the assumption that most of the American public either isn't equipped to or isn't interested in asking the right questions around a lot of these subjects. So it's great that we found that people want to learn more. Um, and I think the first step to that is empowering people with the, the, the questions that they can be able to ask. So what are the effects of nuclear weapons uh, and effects on communities at all parts of the nuclear weapons fuel cycle? How much do we spend on nuclear weapons? Um, who receives the profits and, and why do we have so many? These kinds of questions uh, can really begin to untangle some of the architecture and of bureaucracy and secrecy that surrounds them. Uh, but I think, uh, and Avery brought up this point, it's it's very easy to sort of fall into this sense of doom and that there's, you know, no hope and that this issue is beyond us and out of our control. So another really important part of messaging and narratives around nuclear risk is that another world is possible and that there are alternatives and I do think it is incumbent on us as members of the policy community, NGOs and international and domestic organizations to try to do our parts to offer 
uh, what a compelling alternative might look like. And this is really hard. <laughs> this is no easy task, uh, especially because there is a lot of time and money and powerful interests at work trying to convince us to the contrary. Um, but the history of progressive movements in, in the United States especially uh, has shown it from gender to civil rights to labor, as you know, show, we have a rich tradition of making something that seems impossible actually happen. So um, to circle back also to the role of our generation specifically, you know, we acknowledged at the outset that while older generations have a deeper immediate familiarity and knowledge mm -hmm. of nuclear weapons, given that they lived through the Cold War and had duck and cover drills every day, um, versus today, our generation being more literate on issues like racial justice, gender justice, fighting climate change. Um, I do think, and while, and that it's incredibly important that we connect nuclear policy to all of these matters, um, I think already Gen Z is pretty willing to question some of the foundational assumptions of domestic and foreign policy. For example, some of the um, polling that Dina highlighted in terms of Gen Z being more likely to believe that military approaches are, are overused and that defense budgets could use some reductions. Um, there's a sense that right now, young people are coming of age at a time where many of our systems that have been taken for granted are actually in crisis or collapse. Um, and there's a sort of a general disillusionment with how older generations have dealt with some of these lingering problems affecting our planet's future. And nuclear weapons are very much a part of that. Uh, so I think there is definitely some space and some hope for rethinking some of the fundamental concepts around nuclear weapons postures and policies that have been taken for granted uh, throughout the Cold War and the period afterwards. And so uh, this starts with basically broadening the policy conversation um, in the ways that I think Emma and Avery did a great job highlighting in terms of, you know, Gen Z is, is already invested and interested in racial justice, environmental justice gender justice and nuclear policy is very, very much embedded in all of those subjects. Um, but thinking about how we can connect our present and our past to a potential better future requires, you know, first asking uh, some of the empowering people to start start asking some of the right questions about it. So I'll leave it, I'll leave it there for now. Oh no, thank you very much. That was great. Um, thanks so much for that. I'm seeing accomplishing these tasks is both complicated, but also exciting. I mean, there are, there are opportunities here. So before we go to questions from the audience, and let me just put in a plug, ccga.live is where you can leave those questions. Well, let me ask anyone who cares to respond. So, you know, if we look at the poll, it seems that the results from Gen Z suggest they're more skeptical of nuclear weapons than people of my generation. I mean, so Gen Zers respond, they're less likely to think nuclear weapons make the U.S. safe, they're less likely to think that nukes have an effect at preventing conflict. They're less comfortable with the president having sole authority to use nuclear weapons. And they're less trusting about information about nuclear weapons from the military. They're, they're actually more trusting than others of activist groups and also um, academics of all things. I say that as an academic. Um, so besides your own organization, who do you think has authority with your peers to talk about nuclear weapons? Where where do you think they might they might go for some place that they feel like they can engage with or trust? And like I said, you have to leave off your own organization. Uh, just unmute yourselves and feel free to jump in. Emma. I'm happy to start. Um, so, I mean, I think if we just look at the poll results specifically, um, young people, right, 18 to 29, disproportionately are going to social media for their news and to learn more about nuclear weapons. I think that was 25% said social media would be the first place that they would go to learn about nuclear weapons, which there's a pretty interesting tension there, I'd say, when, as Avery pointed out, fewer of them actually trust the information that they're getting on social media. So there is like a bit of cognitive dissonance there of wanting to go there, but perhaps because it's most accessible um, to them, right? You're already on social media. So it's a place where you can easily feel like you can find influencers or inf information. Um, I do think it's a bit concerning because if they're not trusting it and if they don't have that much background, you're more susceptible to see information that's not true or not be able to tell that it's false or manufactured. And um, so I think that's a bit of a concern.
But in reality, if we are kind of trying to, to follow this lesson in terms of meeting people where they're at, um, I do think social media is the place where, you know, that that's one area where we are seeing um, uh, that having authority in terms of the younger generations um, going there. I mean, I think one other thing I'll flag, though, outside of this and maybe outside of the specific institutions that we've talked about is that people often find authority in people that look like them, right? Um, and one thing that we really struggle with in the nuclear space is um, a lack of representation of women and of people of color. And um, we've done a lot of research on this in terms of just the, the very few women and people of color that get quoted in the media on nuclear issues. It can be, you know, under 10% um, for some issues, um, sometimes under 5% um, for what that looks like. And so I do think this is another challenge that we're facing is that um, a lot of women and people of color don't see themselves in the nuclear space. So they don't see it as a space for them. And they're not even willing to have that initial engagement. So let me just follow up just briefly before someone else jumps in. Uh, so there was a question uh, that we got about what social media do you recommend for engaging people? I don't want to cut Emma off, but I would love to have input here. Um, so I think that's a really interesting question. I think we are at a really interesting time in the history of social media. Um, it's kind of a time of like mass competition. And we're kind of seeing, especially in regards to Twitter situation, kind of what will follow in terms of like, will there be another, you know, marketplace of ideas on the internet, right? Especially in terms of journalism, especially in terms of like the news. Um, I would recommend as opposed to Twitter, I think like the future really is with video. I think that apps like TikTok, apps like Instagram with its reels, like is where a lot of young people get news, get information. I think both of those, especially even YouTube shorts, which I mean, YouTube is really pushing that um, regardless of what, you, what somebody think about it. It's a lot of people watch them, um, especially with video content. It, poses I'll give really quickly just like two challenges in that a it's much harder to put together a video than uh, a tweet and additionally especially with like TikTok there's always some like the algorithm is very confusing sometimes especially with nuclear issues you're using keywords that TikTok may not enjoy you trying to use on its platform and so um, there's definitely some challenges with that but I would suggest that definitely the future is is in video. So Gabriella from your experience engaging uh in the, talking about nuclear weapons in the European context, do you see the same sorts of things happening there? So I kind of actually, while everyone was talking, I, I kind of got an idea of a particular case study in my head because my colleague Valeria Hess, she wrote a great article for Arms Control Today, um, particularly on how younger Ukrainians are thinking about Russians' nuclear threats and how they've kind of coped kind of with this existential dread through humor and memes in social media, which I think is a really fascinating case study in itself in comparison to kind of the United States and how how you see a threat closer to you and how you actually react to it. Um, and I do think it kind of goes into, you know, how do the younger generations think critically about nuclear weapons? And I do think that to make to make a good joke about something, even as a survival tactic, you are critically thinking about it. And you kind of have no other choice when it's just facing right at you. That's not uplifting. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for the, bringing out those uh, differences. So let me let me shift to a slightly different uh, question and still about communicating the risks of nuclear weapons, but let's uh, focusing on, again, Gen Z. So if you had $10 million, how would you convey information about nuclear weapons to Gen Z? I mean, what would you do? And 10 million, it could be 20 million. It's some unbelievably large sum. What would you pick? Would you social media campaign, another movie, commission a K-pop band to write a song? Any takers? I'll start us off, but I'd love to hear uh, from others' thoughts. And I, I, this is a bit of a dodge to the exact ten million dollar question, but you know, a lot of our conversation has focused on social media. I do think popular culture is extremely important, and we live in a time where we're lucky that movies, television, books, all kinds of widespread and accessible forms of entertainment can tell stories that of people for who generations might not have had their stories told. So I think this is a really, really important avenue. 
But I do think that, especially for an issue like nuclear weapons, which has historically remained sort of the gambit of a very small group of policy intellectuals, that academic paradigms, new new paradigms in education are also really important for educating that sort of next generation of policymakers. So I think we need kind of you know, all hands on deck approach here in terms of new discourses across education, popular culture, policy that sees, you know, new approaches that people care about, people of our generation care about. Um, and so that, you know, this is a, a, not to use a militarized metaphor, but definitely a multi-pronged, you know, uh, effort. So. Thanks for that. Does anybody else want to weigh in here? Dina, we're going to include you too. <laughs> As I know Avery was about to jump in, so I'd love to hear what Avery says, but okay. I just um, I just wanted to actually um, foot stomp what Ananya said, because I think when we talk about trying to reach youth, where they're at, you know, we have, of course, social media, that's where they're getting a lot of their news, but also where they're at really is still being educated, still in that space of, of brain development. And if we're, if we're thinking about younger generations also growing up right now, uh, we just don't see much about nuclear weapons in traditional history cur curriculums, right? Maybe at most we have some recognition of the destruction of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, um, but I think it's very rare for people to learn about some of these very real human impacts of nuclear weapons, which make it both more relatable and make the harms very visible. And um, those things like Ananya talked about of the harms against downwinders, the uranium miners that are still getting cancer today because of nuclear weapons. Um, and so I think incorporating that more into educational curriculums, similar to the movement around climate change and integrating lessons on climate change from K through 12 education um, could also be a really important pathway um, over time to really communicate those risks. Avery, you wanna jump in? Yes, I, I was going to jump in and maybe just loop back a little bit to answer the, the $10 million question, if that's all right. Uh, I had some fun with this one. Um, so my my pitch is uh, kind of following up what I had said, to be honest, but it really is what I believe, which is, I think, video that I would put maybe like three quarters of it to like high quality video series like YouTube, like short essay, like video essays, interviews with people. Um, and I would love to focus on both like um, the current reality of nuclear weapons or just like the facts that people may not know, but also like the history and the legacy of all the people who've been affected slash people who've been interested in nuclear issues in the past, people who were there for like the big protests in the 1980s and things like that and showing kind of like the continued history and legacy of both nuclear weapons and the advocacy surrounding them. Um, and then my boring but super practical answer is that the remaining quarter I would use like on advertising and getting people to actually watch those videos. I think like a big piece of this whole conversation is that, you know, social media or just marketing anything online, like we're competing for attention and not just with other issue areas, but private interests and people's time and attention and their jobs and um, just having like the resources to advertise more and to reach people who may not already be following like our organizations and things like that, I think would be incredibly valuable. And then having a high quality thing to show them that they could uh, learn from would be, would be would be my pitch, would be my suggestion. But but there's no influencer in your, you don't want to hire an influencer or is that something you're doing for free pro bono? That you're going to be the nuclear <laughs> influencer. For that, that could be part of the advertising budget. That could be the advertising budget. Good. <laughs> um, so, so let me ask you this question again, sort of in, in a different way. And this is a riff on one of the questions we got asked in the chat. Um, so you're out with your Gen Z friends. What reaction do you get when you talk to them about nuclear weapons? Assuming that you all aren't together talking about nuclear weapons, because that would be a cheat. Yeah, uh, yeah, I wanted to add in on this because actually uh, the reaction that I get is actually very similar to the polling data. Um, People are interested to know how nuclear we weapons work and what is behind them and how do they affect us, but much more so kind of on the technical level of kind of how do they work. At least that's definitely what I found. And how do, and here I'm putting you on the spot, Gabriella, but everyone can jump in and help. So one of the things we've talked about today is making things real for people. So how do you connect the technical effects to, of nuclear weapons to something that's real for people in, the, in their everyday lives. I mean, I talked to some folks 
um, in Hollywood about nuclear issues. And I said, you know, after you've been through one episode of a nuclear crisis on team, some TV show, you really don't need six or seven because it's kind of follows a certain trope. But the key is to bring out the everyday nuclear issues that people face. So can it, how would you connect technical issues about nuclear weapons to every day? I mean, that's a hard one, at least for me. I, I also think it's an extremely and utterly hard question that I actually struggle with a lot, particularly. I feel like in the European context, obviously right now it's so much easier. However, in the American context, I think, I actually think Anana said some really, really good points and, and so did Emma and Avery about connecting these issues to other social issues that are just far more directly impacting the lives of, uh, of normal people themselves. And I also think uh, that everyone at least bats an eyelash whenever we talk about spending on nuclear weapons uh, because people kind of see themselves more directly affected. At least that's also been my experience. And so kind of going to that, I think you naturally, I think we naturally go from one single thing to another. Uh, kind of you, you know, someone tells you this is how much we spend on nuclear weapons and you go, oh, that's interesting. Kind of why would we spend that? It leads to another question. Why would we spend that much? And I think since the other panelists have highlighted particularly the use of social media and particularly Emma about getting those people who have that second question that leads them and capitalizing on that, that really would be the key. And ideally with also cultural and cultural support, because um, I actually, this is quite actually good for, for Carnegie. I remember that at the Carnegie conference, I was sitting next to uh, a graduate student who did both art and nuclear weapons. And I, I was like, that's so interesting. And then she told me, well, Gabrielle, what do you think when you say the word nuclear weapon? The mushroom cloud. You automatically think of art. It's a very powerful thing. I can weigh in on here. Oh, please. Uh, yeah, that's great. Yeah. And I mean, just on that note about the mushroom cloud, I, I think it's interesting, the cultural uh, iconography that we affiliate with nuclear weapons, what comes to mind, I think diversifying that and diversifying the narratives um, on a really emotional level is one of the first steps. Because, for example, taking the example of the mushroom cloud, whose perspective are you taking? And, you know, with that image that first comes to mind, it's far away, it's not under the impact, and it's not people on the ground who are impacted by that bomb. It's basically a bird's eye view. Um, the image that you would get if you were far away, and if you were, for example, um, observing the, the weapon that was dropped. And that is, you know, I mean, and not to spoil the movie Oppenheimer, but uh, that is the, the kind of ultimate image of that film in terms of the Trinity test. And when it comes to diversifying the images um, and the cultural phenomena, the narratives affiliated with nuclear weapons, I think Oppenheimer sets the stage pretty well for a lot of much more diverse um, and much more relatable to the point that Emma made in terms of people who can connect with diverse audiences on this subject. So, you know, even going back to the point about authority, the film Oppenheimer very much, you know, illustrates what I see as one of the main problems where basically it, it is a story, uh, the way you, the, the, the message you'd come away from watching the film might be, you know, this is a story about a lot of genius brilliant scientists and military planners who are all pretty much white men. Uh, this is very much the traditional picture of who's an authority on nuclear issues. And though scientific and technical expertise is obviously really important, there's uh, so much that's left out of that narrative uh, that people could, that's you know, leaving out a, a, a great, uh, a very broad range of audiences who could connect to this issue um, and really feel, you know, deeply connected to not only the history of the Manhattan Project, but also its its impacts and a lot of the untold stories. Like there's an anecdote that always comes to my mind um, when thinking about the Trinity Downwinders and you know who's given authority, who's not given authority, which was uh, a quote from Lewis Hempelman, who was actually the head, basically the lead doctor in the Manhattan Project. And his quote was, you know, quote unquote, a few people were probably overexposed, but they couldn't prove it and we couldn't prove it. So we just assumed we got away with it. And 
you know, there's a story that I think a lot of Americans would be interested to know more about. You know, who was uh, who was exposed in in this you know monumental historic test, and what was the role of knowledge, power, um, money in all of in this complex that we have today, which can be traced back to that year, 1945. Sharon, could I just make a quick interjection based on the polling that adds this? Yeah, just leaping off of what An Ananya just said. You know, it's interesting in the polling that we do, when we ask about nuclear proliferation as a threat to the United States, it's always one of the top most critical threats. And I think it's because Americans think of other people, other countries or non-state actors using a nuclear weapon against the United States. But as our poll shows um, that Sharon and I worked on, when you ask them about the personal threat to them, uh, whether there's harm or benefit, they're unable to answer. So there's really a gap between bringing it home, but definitely a fear from abroad. So I think the stories like you're talking about, Ananya, I think there's been a recent story about uh, some kind of reparation for the people in Los Alamos from those tests those might help bring it, bring the issues related to nuclear weapons more to home. So let me just follow up just briefly, Dina. So and this is a question uh, someone asked in the chat. So what do you make of the notion that people assume nuclear weapons, according to the poll, make us safer, but then they also say they don't have a basic understanding of nuclear policy? I think, I think that kind of gets at the crux of some of the questions that people are trying to raise with films and philosophical debates is that nuclear weapons, they've proven that, yeah, it ended the it ended World War II. It gives us some kind of sense of security knowing that uh, Americans in our poll that uh, the Carnegie Chicago Council poll said that the when we're asking them what are the top reasons that the United States has not been attacked, they say because we have nuclear weapons, that's the top reason, because we have nuclear weapons and that um, deters them from trying to attack us. So on the one hand, there's a sense of safety, but on the other hand, there's the idea that uh, the knowledge that other actors can also um, get their hands on these weapons and use them against us. So we have changed the equation um, by opening up all these possibilities with nuclear weapons. So I'm not sure if that exactly answers the question, but it, it is a multi, it's a, it's such a big question there. Yes, we've definitely benefited from it, but there's a cost to all, not just to Americans, but all of humanity. Um, so there are heavy questions to weigh. Indeed. In well, one of the, so if I, if I were to answer that question myself, it makes me wonder that faith in, if perhaps faith in nuclear weapons is based on a cultural narrative that doesn't necessarily involve rational assessment, right? So it's based on a story that we tell ourselves about nuclear weapons or that we've been told that's been accepted, which then resonates with what I'm hearing from the panelists here, that the way you communicate with people about the dangers of nuclear weapons is also by connecting it to other things in their lives and the story of how those things relate to nuclear weapons to help them then engage more with the benefit or harm uh, that they pose. So I'm conscious here of the time. I think we have two minutes. So let's do rapid fire round question for all of our panelists. So surprise, not don't have $10 million to give you. But let's say someone comes to you tomorrow and says, Hey, I saw the Oppenheimer movie. I want to learn more about nuclear weapons, or I want to be more involved. What's the thing that you would tell them? I'm happy to kick us off. Um, sure. So I think we've talked about so many platforms. One of the things that we haven't talked about is what are the best platforms really for deep learning about these issues. I think we know that the ones that are not necessarily are quick tweets, right? To Avery's point, even traditional news only really tends to spend a minute or two on nuclear weapon, weapons, not enough to actually get in depth about what these policies are, just that, you know, Putin's been nuclear saber rattling once again. Um, and so I would tell them to, to go to certain platforms that we know that can talk 
talk about these issues in depth so that they can actually feel more knowledgeable and secure about these issues. And um, podcasts are a really great medium to do this, um, as well as you know sites like the Bulletin and other sites that feature the voices of downwinders and people impacted um, by nuclear weapons. So collectively, we have 30 seconds left. Avery, where would you send people? What would you oh, I was going to I was going to say the bulletin, but also places like Outrider and Inkstick, where you can hear directly from people and like press the button and other podcasts like that. That's my answer. Thank you. Gabriella. I think actually this is where I was going to insert arms control today and the arms control association and also the Berlin organizations of my fellow panelists because this is actually where we make a difference we make a difference in forming the public we make a difference in forming policy makers and that is that is really the best answer i can give uh, ananya you have four seconds yep put something all of the above and i'd also say in terms of what you can do go to expandriga.org and nuclearvoices.org to see how you can support nuclear frontline communities Thank you all so much for being willing to have this conversation today. Gabriella, Ananya, Emma, Avery, and of course, Dina. Thanks for making us think about nuclear weapons and connecting them to a different group of, group of folks and learning from what we get when we do that connection. Thanks so much from the Carnegie Corporation. This is Sharon Weiner. Thank you very much for joining us today.